uh, welcome. I'm Professor Wallace. I'm the chairman of the National Law Institute. We're your host today. Uh, many of you know that uh, our work is principally in dealing with developing countries. We, we can call ourselves the largest law of lawyers in the developing world. Um, I mentioned that because I think we all yep. realize we're dealing with a global challenge. We need global leadership. Yes. Anyway, I hope today we will not just focus on the United States, but remember those developing countries which the ally tries to help, who I think um, are going to be very, let's put it this way, they're going to be enormously challenged in the months, in the months to come. Uh, at this point, let me turn over the program to Yona. Thank you very much, Dan. And um, I, I just want, before I introduce the distinguished panel, um, I, I want to mention the context, at least uh, what we call the academic or whatever, that obviously, as we know, the biological security concerns are uh, features of history, ranging uh, all the way from uh, Mother Nature's visits to man made threats of state and non state uh, actors. And um, all of us remember two years ago that we marked the 100th uh, year anniversary of the 1918 influenza pandemic that uh, killed between 50 to 100 million people. On a personal note, uh, some members, I understand, of my mother's family died during this pandemic. Uh, at any rate, uh, we are facing the coronavirus um, pandemic and threats and so forth. So uh, really the question uh, arises, as we know, uh, whether the international community uh, is equipped, as uh, Professor Wallace mentioned, the focus would be on the international community to identify and prevent or counter and respond to the coronavirus and other biological challenges. So basically, I think what we're trying to do today is to look at some of the best uh, lessons the emerging uh, risk and the needed uh, strategy, not only in the US, but uh, globally. And uh, fortunately, uh, we have a very distinguished uh, panel. Initially, we discussed uh, some of these uh, issues uh, last month on March 26th, when we uh, had an initial uh, program to discuss some of the areas such as medicine, law, and security, diplomacy, and all that. Uh, obviously, it is uh, interdisciplinary um, approach. And uh, I think today we're very fortunate to have a very distinguished uh, program. What I, I would like to do with uh, your permission is to uh, first introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Rita Caldwell. And uh, she will open up with uh, her presentation and then we'll follow up with the introduction of the other panelists. And uh, then we have a few commentators. Uh, again, uh, very briefly, uh, Professor Rita Carwell is uh, well known internationally because of her work over many decades. So she's currently distinguished professor at the University of Maryland College Park and Johns uh, Hopkins University of Bloomberg School of Public Health and uh, also a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy uh, Studies. Uh, we're honored to work with her in the past 20 years almost and the past couple of years we published a number of reports in this area. So, um, uh, Professor Caldwell will make her first uh, presentation and then we'll continue with our other colleagues. Well, thank you, Yona, for inviting me to speak at this uh, special ambassadors forum. Uh, it's an honor and also a, a unique opportunity 
to be speaking on Zoom, uh, the Zoom conferencing. Though I must say that um, I've been essentially glued to Skype and Zoom and a series of webinars since mid-March when the universities um, and all the others, including schools and businesses, uh, went into lockdown. So let me begin by saying firstly that um, we appear to be in the throes of what um, is the third year global epidemic, a pandemic. The last um, global pandemic being the 1918 influenza pandemic. I'd like to speak from the viewpoint of uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, as a genuine bio threat, bioterrorism. And the terrorist this time is nature or simply biology. I'll use the anthrax bioterrorism event of 9-11 that occurred in 2001 as a prototype or perhaps a paradigm. After the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York City, in late October that year, a series of mysterious illnesses occurred, and they were very quickly determined to be deliberate release of Bacillus anthracis. Now with SARS and then MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2, the perpetrator is us, or those of us who remember the comic strip philosopher Pogo. We have indeed met the enemy, and it is us. The source of SARS and SARS-CoV-2 has been traced to bats, perhaps transmitted to humans uh, either directly from bats or uh, from bats to civets to humans via a public marketplace in Wuhan, China. Peter Daszak and his uh, team at EcoHealth Alliance in New York City have been working in Asia and the Middle East, and they've provided the best evidence for the source of COVID-19 as being really derived from bats. It was during my term as director of the National Science Foundation that 9-11 uh, occurred and a team of federal agency representatives was formed um, to advise the CIA and the FBI on tracking the perpetrator of the anthrax event. I served as chairman and the team activity was classified. And we served for six years employing DNA analysis to successfully track down the source of the anthrax. Now, of course, we have the enormous power of DNA and RNA sequencing to detect, identify, and confirm infectious agents. And so let me illustrate what this involves, at least the method. And so if I could have that first slide, um, it demonstrates the ability to extract the DNA and then to uh, take the community DNA, uh, run it through a sequencer, it can be any sequencer, and um, uh, let's go to the, to the sequencer in the next step. Um, and then once we have the sequence reads, we match them up with a very massive database, you know, the next step. And this massive database allows us to identify um, and uh, determine the, uh, the actual characterization um, by um, matching up with uh, the microorganisms in the database. And then this gives us uh, the ability to determine the presence of genes that code for antibiotic resistance or for pathogenicity properties. And so ultimately the success is that it allows us to identify and characterize very accurately microorganisms. Now that, that's an area that I've been working on for the last decade. Uh, there are, um, I mean, it's clear that the value of sequencing and the rapid um, PCR test, uh, the polymer polymerase chain reaction, allows detection. Um, and what we've been able to do by understanding all of the microorganisms in the gut, on the skin, in the lungs, is that this is really a very powerful tool, a bioforensic tool. Uh, as you can see from this particular chart, uh, the gut flora uh, on average in China is distinguishable from individuals in Spain and from Tanzania, et cetera. Uh, so this becomes a powerful public health bioforensic tool, but also a measure of being able to determine um, health and uh, well-being. So um, I mean, that's enough for the slides. I just wanted to demonstrate that 
it's a very powerful tool. And the, um, the rapid test, the PCR polymerase chain reaction, allows detection and the testing allows determination of those with symptoms and the determined either negative, not carrying the virus, that is symptomless individuals, indeed can be shown to be negative of the virus, and then symptoms that uh, could indicate presence of the virus, coronavirus in this case, um, either as negative or positive. Uh, but the critical uh, part is detection of um, when uh, symptoms are absent, but the virus is present. And of course, those with overt symptoms as indeed positive, because that allows urgent treatment to be done. Now, I'm not going to elaborate on the strictures with which we're all very familiar. Uh, physical distance, hand washing, staying in place, masks and gloves now, um, when on essential business or doing some essential activity. But the value of physical distancing is really critical. It's been illustrated, I think, very effectively by a team at Ohio State. What they've done is to place ping pong balls on mouse traps set to activate. And they activate on contact. And the mouse traps are all lined up very close to each other. And then you drop a ping pong ball on, and all of a sudden, there's this, this chaos uh, that ensues with ping pong balls flying in every direction as the traps are sprung. But when you repeat the experiment and you place the traps with the ping pong balls spaced apart, and then you drop a ping pong ball, there is no catastrophic event. It's an excellent demonstration of the value of distancing and what happens when you don't in terms of transmitting the virus. Now, I'm going to close by a challenge to the panel. How does a country deem it safe to return to the new normal? Uh, that would be in quotation marks, essentially daily life until a vaccine or treatment with drug are available. Um, there's an excellent article in Science Magazine that's just been released today and projects the transmission dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 through the post-pandemic period. And the point made by Stephen Kissler and his colleagues from the Harvard School of Public Health is that um, there's very likely going to be a recurrent wintertime outbreaks of SARS-CoV-2. And that's going to be um, after this initial pandemic wave. But like um, the current uh, steps we're taking, prolonged or intermittent social distancing is going to be necessary into 2022. So we will need to do expansive testing, universal testing, and we will need to determine immune response. So I'm going to leave for the physicians on the panel to discuss how we use uh, immune response. And then I understand as of today, there's a report that a, a, an emergency room physician uh, has been successfully treated uh, with rheumatoid arthritis drug called Ectemra. So uh, it's going to involve global partnership, which our honorable ambassadors can eloquently describe for us. So with this introductory set of remarks, I will turn it over to the panel and thank you for the opportunity to um, provide this very brief introduction. Thank you very much, Professor Caldwell, uh, for your presentation that you provided the framework for further discussion, uh, looking at also the global dimension. Incidentally, those who are interested in some of her uh, extensive writings, uh, all the way from uh, biological terrorism, the international dimensions, to weapons of mass destruction, etc., would be uh, pleased to provide you the sources and the links. Now, I would like to move on with our distinguished panel uh, to discuss some of their uh, interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, the first uh, speaker is going to be Ambassador 
Vizera Simonovic of the Embassy of Croatia. Uh, he has a very distinguished um, background, including a career in journalism and academic research as well, high level positions in the Croatian uh, government. Uh, for example, as director of the Office of National Security Council, ambassador to Israel, uh, defense state secretary, a coordinator with NATO and assistant foreign uh, minister. And uh, as many of you know, Croatia now holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union. Uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, professor Alexander, uh, Professor Caldwell, uh, Professor Wallace, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my, my pleasure being here. Not necessarily a, a, a pleasure discussing this topic we had to um, simply uh, address, but that's 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 the way it is. And the uh, let me let me let me can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, let me start by uh, by developing what I would like to do to develop a few uh, themes defining the defining uh, where we are now. Uh, in an intersection between uh, the diplomacy, international affairs, uh, national security, and the, and the economy. And the, maybe I should start, uh, I, I wish to start by saying that the, what, we, what would not seem to be particularly functional, what necessarily uh, is something I wouldn't like to do, and this is the, uh, to apportion the blame, to enter the, into a blame game, to do the finger pointing across the borders, searching for scapegoats. Uh, what I would advocate, what we would advocate is certainly to, certainly to have a more constructive, uh, forward-looking approach. Having said that, we have, to, we have to think necessarily about the lessons learned. The le lessons learned uh, 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 in this very hard moment when, when we are in the middle of it all. And the different countries, different people, different, different groups of countries have different uh, experiences, different re uh, responses, different results. The results, the results in a scientific sense and a political sense, in an economic sense, if you wish, are incomplete. And the, but the uh, 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 overall, uh, we can we can certainly uh, 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 have some uh, uh, lessons learned when it comes on the uh, when it comes to the scientific side, uh, concluding as it had been concluded a long time ago. That uh, the uh, the uh, the um, uh, 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 an un unhealthy uh, intrusion uh, into the wild, an un uh, uh, unhealthy uh, uh, connection between the uh, wild animals, domestic animals, uh, dietary practices, can can uh, uh, spell a disaster. Um, we uh, we knew and now we know also that the uh, international community and the nation states should be having a more more um, transparent and stronger, uh, faster uh, uh, reporting mechanisms. That is what we all know. We will be we will be getting back to that in, in the years to come. Uh, but the uh, the uh, my line of business being national security and international affairs, I would I would uh, primarily focus on that. And in, in that regard, we, we have to conclude that the uh, what we have seen and what we are still seeing is is a lack of uh, a coordinated and efficient, efficient uh, 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 global response, international cooperation. We have been uh, lacking efficient uh, uh, multilateral mechanisms. There was no meaningful, meaningful international response. There is a big question mark over the uh, the existence of the international community as such. The uh, in in all our cases, the uh, the um, the initial response and the and the um, response even even at this stage is overwhelmingly national. So the, uh, while at the same time, uh, we and the EU is of a strong opinion that this is, uh, this is indeed a, a global pandemic requiring a global response. Uh, that, is, that is applicable within Europe, meaning that we need more Europe for addressing this crisis and similar crisis. And that the also, uh, when discussing about the international community, we don't need less, we, we, it's not that we need less international community. We need more uh, uh, international community, more multilateralism, uh, more, uh, more, more coordination, and the, that would be that is that is valid 
uh, uh, as of now, when we are in the middle of crisis, and it would be it would be as valid uh, when we will be facing recovery. Uh, uh, that is that is something which needs to be coordinated and supported. And the uh, the uh, 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 it's it's hard to it's hard to think about the. Uh, the the uh, in, in a systematic fashion maybe what are the lessons learned when again while, while we are not having complete results and while while we are in the middle middle of it all but uh, uh, particularly and this is this is particularly re relevant for the uh, uh, for our countries which are all all of our, our countries are affected uh, some of them are coping better some of them are not coping so well uh, but we think. Uh, not only we have to think not only over the horizon once the this this particular crisis passes eventually, but the uh, what comes next within the crisis and that is how we should be uh, jointly able to support the most vulnerable. The, uh, Africa is getting getting more and more focused in terms of the uh, being exposed to the to the contagion and at the same time not having the uh, not by, by far not having the instruments. Which are at the disposal of the of the of the of, of a more developed world. Uh, what 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 uh, uh, what we think lo looking again over the horizon, it's certainly a necessity to have almost something like a global Marshall Plan for the economic recovery. Uh, we see we see a necessity of having the the EU, EU European Union and the United States in the lead. We see the U.S. as an indispensable crucial global actor. You, the U.S. has been, has been in the lead uh, 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 throughout the, uh, the, uh, the um, modern, modern history we have been living from the, and during the, during the after, Second World War and after. Uh, in, in this case, the U.S. has been terribly uh, affected by the crisis and the uh, U.S. leadership is, 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 has always been very much needed. In terms of the, uh, the 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 reach, in terms of the scientific uh, strength, economic strength, security uh, weight, the U.S. can pull, and it's, it's, it's within the intermodern international system, the U.S. is is simply an indispensable actor. Uh, the EU, the EU is increasingly in this particular crisis taking the center stage. Again, as I said, we 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 see that the. Uh, 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 within the European context, there is a necessity of a strong Europe, of a strong European uh, coordinated uh, reaction when it comes to the uh, apportioning the uh, the uh, medical supplies, uh, controlling borders, uh, exchanging scientific endeavors, uh, work, working jointly and the, with other global partners. And again, the US, the US uh, uh, by, by nature has always been the most, the most the strongest and the uh, simply the natural uh, partner for the for Europe and the uh, this 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 alliance across the Atl Atlantic uh, has all the benefits for the all other players in the world, particularly in dealing with the, this particular crisis. And it has been uh, again to getting back to the lessons learned. It has been for over for over many years, for decades. The issue of emerging diseases has been on the on on, on the radar. For the scientific of the scientific community of the national security experts, I, from my personal experience, I was involved in drafting uh, national security papers and national security strategies of Croatia. And I remember the uh, the the, uh, the uh, consultations process leading to the final document that we always had health experts and they, they were always warning us and we were always put always putting that into the into documents that the emerging diseases and eventual. Uh, uh, emergence of, of different outbreaks uh, uh, of of the similar or the same nature we are facing now is something we we, we should be uh, we should be bracing for, and now now it is it, it as always it, it came as a surprise, it came as a surprise. Everything comes as a surprise. I think that is in the I guess in the human nature that we are always surprised. Uh, from the from the. Uh, 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 Political perspective, I, I think there are a political and economic perspective. I think they are they are, they are two again uh, on top of dealing with the uh, with the, what we have at hand, what we have to uh, deal with uh, in an emergency fashion, and that is the, the suppress the, uh, the the pandemic 
to flatten the curve and to finally to neutralize the, the contagion is to think that they, while doing it, we should not, uh, we should not, uh, we should preserve democracy. We should uh, keep the, the human rights. Uh, and certainly we should not allow uh, this crisis to uh, have uh, dangerous spillovers into the, uh, through the economy, maybe through the, through the ideology, into some nasty, nasty uh, political uh, fallouts and aftermaths once this particular crisis passes and the, uh, everything passes, as you know, this, this one. The, the, uh, the, uh, I was just asked the other day, one of the leading uh, 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 epidemiologists uh, leading the creation fight against the coronavirus. What is, in her, her opinion, the uh, the best ca realistic best case scenario? Uh, Professor Caldwell, you may you may be particularly interested, interested in hearing that. Uh, and she said, "Well, we, we didn't know, of course, but the uh, uh, the you can never know. the uh, The experience with SARS earlier was that the, the, it was uh, again uh, very contagious and uh, very very deadly, and it suddenly disappeared." So we can never know. This this particular virus, I guess, and I'm not. I'm, I'm again I'm a social scientist. I'm a national security expert. I'm not a biological or medical scientist. But it may it may stay with us for a while. We, we, we have to assume that it will be staying for us for a considerable future. That is that by finding a vaccine, finding a, 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 a an efficient cure is an absolute priority. But it may again. Uh, we simply don't know. We know the at this stage again we just. Uh, uh, know what we don't know, and we don't know much, I guess. Thank you very much. I'm open for the for the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, uh, for your message, uh, focusing on the strong uh, European leadership and more global coordination. And um, the interdisciplinary uh, aspects are, are important. We're co coming back to some of your issues, and Professor Caldwell, Later on, uh, after we complete the first uh, round with our speakers, uh, and I want to thank you also uh, personally and professionally for your contribution to our security challenges in the Balkans and your uh, contribution to that. Now I'm going to uh, invite uh, Professor Megan Delaney uh, to make a presentation. Uh, she is Associate Professor of Pathology Pediatrics at George Washington University and the Chief of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and Medical Director of Transfusion Medicine at the Children's National Medical Center. And uh, we want to thank her also for her contribution to our studies on biological terrorism. Professor Delaney, please. Hi, Dr. Alexander. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I see yeses. Okay. Um, can I have my slides put up, please? Thank you. So this is me. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a perspective from a laboratory here in, in Washington, DC. I run the laboratory at Children's National um, and we're a 323 bed hospital. You can see the rest of our numbers here. Um, next slide. So why, um, what, you know, what is the importance of the laboratory in the global pandemic? And I, I might be stating obvious things, but you know, when you pull the curtain back, which is why I have the picture there, um, that you know, the SARS-CoV-2 does not have a specific proven treatment nor a vaccine at this point, and this is the very nature of pandemic uh, novel disease. Um, and really, we have to know our enemy to be able to fight our enemy. And so really what has happened um, and, and has been my uh, lived experience for the past couple of months is that it's thrown the laboratory, which usually is a bit behind the curtain, into the spotlight for many different things. Um, but it has really become, because there's no treatment, um, there has been an enormous focus uh, on testing um, because that's the only way we can see our enemy and then work to contain it using our traditional um, 
techniques of containing pandemic, which is social distancing um, and other uh, social measures. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna tell you about four specific laboratory um, issues that really are public health issues. Um, but you know, from the perspective of, of myself as a pathologist that runs a laboratory. So the very first um, thing to hit us um, was the blood supply. Um, what happened, I can tell you the story from Seattle and it really took place as wildfire across our nation, is that once the virus was known to be in a city, the um, companies closed down and those businesses and school closures um, led to blood drives being canceled, um, which makes perfect sense from the perspective of wanting to accomplish social distancing. But more than 70% of the blood for the nation um, comes from blood drives. This is when blood donor staff um, take their equipment out to a company or to a school gymnasium and collect blood. Um, and so what Seattle saw over a period of about five days was a significant drop in their blood collections, more than 60%. And what they did, again, they were the very first city to have a pretty broad um, uh, infection going on in the community, was they called um, into our national um, pandemic or emergency response system for blood and what happens is that the other blood suppliers around the country ship blood to the region. And that quickly um, was able to support the city's needs. Because remember, when something like this is happening, there's still patients in the hospital with cancer, there's still motor vehicle accidents, there's still emergency surgery, and blood transfusion, there's no, there's no a replacement for blood transfusion. So the disaster response system for our country actually worked pretty well for that situation, but then what happened is that it's a pandemic. And so it's it, unlike a hurricane or when 9-11 happened and it, when there is mass casualty and the other blood centers can ship blood into the region, when you're dealing with the entire nation being impacted, it really has taken a lot of media and a lot of um, so, social media and, and re-education of the public to please continue to come out and donate. So in fact, for, for Children's National, I actually created a letter which we pr can provide to our donors to say, to carry with them or on their phone to say where they're going when they're coming to donate blood. Because um, without blood, we the hospital and healthcare would really be very crippled. Um, so I can, I'm, I'm very also happy to say that our blood supply right now is very healthy. We've had an enormous turnout and sensitization of the public um, because of the um, media and the recruitment efforts that we've really um, increased lately. So the point of this though, is that when it's pandemic, when it's really impacting the entire country and the entire world, you can't rescue each other um, and, and blood supply really shows that. Next slide. So the second, uh, third and fourth issue are all about testing for COVID. Um, so, you know, really what this, the beginning issue I'll call the second issue is test availability. Um, the way that the public health laboratory systems work in our country as a very brief sketch is that the CDC and the Department of Health laboratories in the states, um, they test for um, and confirm infectious disease um, pathogens in their laboratories that either to a level that usually the hospitals don't do or for certain emerging infections that would not make sense for a hospital to do that kind of testing. So for instance, leishmaniasis is not a, is a rare disease in the United States. And so you don't usually do that testing in your own laboratory. You would probably send that to a Department of Health or CDC laboratory. So what happened with COVID is it started in that scenario, that it's a rare disease, it's emerging, and it started in these government laboratories. And then um, what happened is the FDA put on top of that a regulation called the Emergency Use Authorization Process or the EUA. And this is quite a barrier for a laboratory as a hospital laboratory like mine or any, any hospital laboratory. We are regulated under CLIA, which is a high, as a high complexity lab. Typically, whenever I bring in a new laboratory test to, my, uh, to offer to patients here, I have a lot of regulations and requirements to make sure that the test is performing correctly but I do not have to submit it to the FDA. But with coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we were forced to do that or to wait for a company who was doing that for us to get through the process. 
and I, I will say for absolute certain, it did slow things down. It was done um, to make sure that the testing was correct, but I'm sure you also heard on the news that the CDC assay itself had some problems at the beginning, which they then sorted out. But these um, hurdles did um, prolong the time until um, hospital laboratories that really are needed to have widespread testing um, to not involve the hospital laboratories is, is a big um, mistake. So eventually the hospital laboratories have come online, but I do believe part of our response to this pandemic, a weakness was that how, that, that was slow to happen and it might have been able to happen faster if we had thought this out or implemented it differently beforehand. Um, next slide. Um, the third issue is uh, about the testing is the test supply availability and specifically what I'm talking about here is if you see one of our staff members here, she's collecting a swab in full PPE and she's holding a little vial of viral transport media. And so the collection kits, which are the swabs and the tubes with the media in them have been in very short supply. And what you see on the other side of the screen is that our research institute um, actually pulled the recipe for viral transport media. Um, we made this plan about three weeks before we got low on supplies. And then we had them make, that's a thousand tubes right there, um, make those tubes of media for us. And interestingly, our own Department of Health uh, ran out of the media. So those are actually being shipped to the Department of Health. Um, so just to show uh, the, the wonderful thing that has been a positive about coronavirus is the collaboration between um, all sorts of groups from my research institute to the clinical lab and as well to the Department of Health is just one example. But, um, but those um, test supply availability is a real issue. Uh, next slide. Um, the, the next issue, the test supply availability continuing on is actually in the laboratory itself. So these are pictures from my laboratory. Um, these are three different pieces of equipment, laboratory equipment that run the viral um, SARS-CoV-2 assay. And you can see, um, I put some, some numbers here, but what has happened is that the reagents or the supplies, you can see the SARS-CoV-2 foil package, um, that, that we don't have enough of those. So even though I have the machine, and it's true for all of these instruments here, um, and these are some of the instruments you've heard um, the task force on the news every day talk about. We have those, some of them, but we're not able to obtain enough because the, the industry does not have um, enough manufacturing ability because they also have supply chain issues. And so these are just describing um, if I would be able to do, you know, with the machine on the right, 540 tests a day, but I only can do 20 to 30 a day because of the number of cartridges that they can supply. And just so you know, the Washington Post came and, and interviewed me and that there's a little two minute video there that explains each of these instruments and, and what they do. So if you wanna watch that, I'm sure that Dr. Alexander can share that with you. Um, next slide. So um, the fourth issue is patient access. And besides being diagnostically important, this is really epidemiologically important. And so this is a, actually a picture of our, our pop-up collection site. Um, it's located on the campus of Trinity University here in Washington, D.C. And what you see is um, a line of cars coming in and the three white tents are our three collection centers where kind of like a, a, a pit stop on a racetrack, the car, um, first of all, the patient to come needs to have a prescription by their physician. And this is only for children under 22 because Children's National takes care of children um, as their mission. Um, and so they come to the, the front by the blue van, um, they get told to wait, and then they are told to come to one of the three tents, and then the, um, the paperwork is exchanged, and then the collection is done of the child. We, we've learned that uh, collecting children in car seats actually in some ways is easier. Um, and then off they go. So um, we've been able to expand access to our community, um, and, and we're really proud of this work. Um, next slide. And, and here is um, our CEO, Dr. Kurt Newman, um, explaining the site to our mayor, uh, Muriel Bowser, um, and then the whole team. Um, and when you look down at the picture down below, we're socially distanced there in the picture, but uh, the president of Trinity University is there as well. So it was a wonderful partnership. Um, and, and we continue to collect uh, the, the samples um, for patients at this site to serve the district. And we're also, this, this serves the district, Virginia and uh, Maryland. 
Next slide. So my last slide is as here is you know so some re my recommendations for the next pandemic and to and to add to the the topics that we can discuss um, during our comment period at the end of this session is that you know our laboratory plan should be layered into our pre-existing plans for disaster and pandemic response. I do think that we need to consider how we can streamline regulations to allow um, hospital laboratories to to come online faster um, to support access to testing. And I do think that we really need to consider our stockpiles on the national and international level, that these should be diverse um, materials, they should be actively managed. And I think that we should consider if our industry partners, as I showed you, I have a lot of supply chain issues because the industry can't keep up with the demand, that if industry should be required to participate in some sort of stockpiling as well. So my last slide, just one more slide, I think. Uh, just a, uh, a a warrior quote that you know I do feel like we are um, have been have been in a war in the fog of war sometimes and, and really that you know I think the laboratory's perspective is if you know your enemy um, you can um, help to vanquish your enemy and um, and it's been a, a wonderful learning experience we have much more to learn and I want to thank uh, Dr. Alexander and the Potomac Institute for inviting me to give some comments today especially with this illustrious audience thank you so much. Dr. Alexander, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can now. Yeah. Okay, great. Maybe I should scream, but at any rate, thank you very much for uh, trying to emphasize the importance of the lab, the blood drives and the supplies uh, availability, the patient's uh, access and some of your recommendations. We really appreciate that. We appreciate the Sun Tzu also quote, obviously, that we try to learn from the past. The tragedy is that we learn from the past that maybe we don't learn from the past. And this is one issue that we have to consider. So thank you very much again. And we'll come back to you a little bit later on. We're going to move on to Dr. Richard Reff who participated in our earlier event on March 26. Welcome again. Uh, Dr. Ref is orthopedic surgeon and is a sports medicine specialist uh, dealing with uh, sports issues, sports medicine committee, for example, of the US Olympic Committee and other committees. And uh, he, he will uh, present a view of a practitioner and some of the other concerns. Dr. Ref. Thank you, Yona. Um, first slide, please. Um, it was a nice segue um, that you uh, just spoke. Um, actually, in the, um, from a historical perspective, um, sometimes there's the, the silver lining in the black cloud. Um, my grandfather was a a uh, recent immigrant to the United States in, uh, in 1917. He, was, he had been in the United States for four years and actually it was the uh, Spanish flu that saved his life. Uh, he was drafted in the army to World War I and he was supposed to report to, for basic training in um, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And the base was closed because of the virus. So he stayed uh, stateside. Um, and some of his brothers actually went to France during World War I, um, and um, uh, that was the rest of the story. Um, but I think we're all aware of uh, Churchill's famous statement in the House of Commons in 1948. Next slide, please. So what about lessons learned? Are they, have we learned anything? Um, have we forgotten? or are we just ignoring things? I came across this uh, in preparation for today. Next slide. And does this look familiar? Um, we all are certainly very much aware of all the um, things that we're supposed to do. Next slide. 
We certainly are very much aware today of personal and protective equipment, the N95 masks. Next slide, please. And certainly social distancing and activity restrictions. Next slide. Now, if you go to the bottom of this slide, you'll see when this poster was made. This was 2005. This is 15 years ago. So you, there's a lot of questions that can be raised just from that alone, like where are we today when we perhaps either have quickly forgotten, ignored, or it's, it certainly is um, something that we need to discuss. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges or how does the pandemic affect me um, as a physician? And what are the challenges for the non-hospital based, non-emergency specialists such as myself? Well, we still have non-COVID-19 problems. As an orthopedic surgeon treating for the most part um, active, healthy young people who are injured in sports, I and my colleagues have had to change on the fly how we manage our patients. For all of what I encounter, the problems are not life-threatening. However, they are still potentially life-altering. For example, um, just recently I had a 15-year-old female who had undergone reconstructive surgery on her knee for an ACL tear about two years ago. And while playing softball, just prior to the shutdown, she re-injured her knee, tearing the ACL graft, and also tearing the cartilage in her knee, playing softball. Well, then the edict immediately came down forbidding elective surgery. So now, this young lady, who certainly did not have a life-threatening problem, uh, however, her ultimate outcome may in fact be compromised because of the COVID-19 restrictions on surgery. Previously, the usual and customary treatment would have consisted of surgical reconstruction of her ACL, repair of her meniscus, and approximately six to nine months of physical therapy and rehabilitation before being allowed to return to sports. Now, it's unknown. All of these milestones, which were fairly well established, are no longer in play. So we don't know when she'll get surgery. And then whenever she has surgery, we don't know when she'll recover, when she might play, and what she might play, and what might even be available to her. Next slide, please. So as surgeons, um, we've actually had to redefine the term urgent as it, prepare, as it pertains to our medical care. Well, our governor in Maryland and the Maryland State Department of Health has been um, in their leadership to us and gave us very, very clear, consistent guidelines. Next slide, please. So, and one of the things that we're learning with this COVID-19 pandemic is that leaders of all kind, and as doctors, we indeed are leaders, politicians, and other people who are influencing and direct the activity of others are certainly in positions of leadership. And we are now learning that in order to deliver confidence, we must be clear, we must be consistent, and also we need to be evidence-based. Next slide. In contrast, and I'm not trying to poke fun, but in contrast to what we see here, and that is Dr. Fauci, who everybody certainly knows around the world right now, has been clear, consistent, and his advice has been with the basis of evidence. Whereas our president, unfortunately, has not been clear, has not been consistent, and clearly has not been evidence-based with a lot of his recommendations. Next slide. So to try to alleviate, one of the things that um, has certainly come about in today's environment 
is that some think tanks and organizations have really come to the forefront trying to help alleviate the stress um, in the chaos that we're in existence. And one I'm, I'm actually just making reference to is the Aspen Project Play uh, from the Aspen Institute, which is, uh, I became, um, I learned about them at one of the Olympic Committee meetings a number of years ago, and, and they're very much in the forefront of dealing with youth and youth sports. Next slide. So what are the challenges that we face as a society, as is healthcare professionals, that we actually inherited some of these? Well, for example, childhood obesity, which is a huge problem in the United States, potentially is not going to get better because of this pandemic, because people, kids, are not being uh, given the opportunity to be as active as they perhaps once were. Um, also, approximately 38% of young people between the ages of six and 12 are involved in organized sports. And most of these organized sports are put on by organizations, many of which are gonna be failing businesses at the conclusion of this uh, pandemic. Next slide, please. So this kind of shows you just in a, in, in a very graphic way how we in the United States, in comparison to other countries, um, which are not uh, developing countries for the most part, are winning the race of obesity. And this is not really a race that we really are, should be proud of or that we wish to remain. Next slide, please. Now, even with this pandemic, there now also becomes a number of opportunities that also, if we should so desire to grab onto these new um, opportunities, they're around. So we can take the opportunity to change the landscape of youth sports, to have more availability, more creativity, and introduce more free play. And this is not something just for the United States, and we talk in terms of global response we're all in this together and our um our social uh, shutdown essentially affects everybody so these are challenging times for anyone who believes in the power of sports not just to entertain us but also to build us uh, physically and emotionally and now for the first time in history children from all backgrounds have equal access to a sports experience Unfortunately, that sports experience is none. School sports are off, as is school itself. Children are often cooped up at home. And, if they, and last year, about 38% of kids played a team sport on a regular basis, and today that's surely close to zero. Kids are losing their social, emotional, and cognitive benefits from sports. And in the absence of sports, we realize more fully than ever how much we want sports in the lives of our children. We can already see heightened enthusiasm for certain things like outdoor recreation, hiking, biking, running, and other activities where, where allowed when people can maintain a safe distance from each other. And we're also seeing an explosion on the 21st century in the usage of virtual training apps on the computer. So what can adults do now to prepare for when when the games return? Well, certainly the, the reintroduction of free play, I've anecdotally said that when I was a kid, this is what we did. We went to the schoolyard after school. We made up our own games. We created our own rules. Our teammate one day would be our opponent the next day. So there was a lot of um, personal respect that we had to, that we had to demonstrate. We had to we had to occupy the same space on a daily basis. We need to re-examine our own balance with sports as parents and as grown-ups, and that of the child. It's a time to take a deep breath, talk to your child and say, you know, try to find out what it is that they're getting from the activity itself. Next slide. So when the virus restrictions lift, 
we'll see a greater demand for organized youth and school sports programming, but potentially there's gonna be less supply and demand because of the failing of a lot of businesses. Even if the curve starts to lift, we start, and, and we start to have gatherings of five, 10, 15 people, that still is not enough to run a sports league. We also know what happened in the last recession. Regular participation in team sports fell from 45% in 2008 to 38% in 2014 amongst kids. Next slide. We're also seeing some really cool things that are happening in response to the sports industry kind of retooling themselves. This is something that came out of the Sports and Business Journal this week, and that is this company that makes ski goggles is now, create, now created a grassroots campaign called Goggles for Docs. And in the first week actually um, sent out about 9,000. Next slide, please. So we're also in the midst of some uncharted waters with regard to the major sporting events that, has been, that have been part of our society and culture for as long as we've been around. So what have we seen? Well, we've seen, first of all, the Olympic Games have been postponed. The Maccabee Games in Israel, which I've been involved with, postponed. We're not really sure what's gonna happen to the World Cup. The professional sports in the United States, the NBA, the National Hockey League, Major League Baseball, and National Football League are all on hold, and no one really knows or understands what's gonna happen. Basically, we, we have challenges of, we don't know what the risks are, but we have to try to think of ways of balancing the risks, making people aware of the implied risks that might occur if we all have to gather together. We don't know what the status of testing, we don't know, there's so many things we just don't know right now. But I also, in, my, in, in the way I uh, treat some of my patients, I always, talk to them about what I call the seatbelt principle. And that is when I talk to a young person about wearing some protective gear, they say, well, when you get into a car, what's the first thing that you do? They say, well, I put on my seatbelt. I said, well, why do you do that? He says, because that's what you're supposed to do. I said, well, do you expect to get into an accident? No, but if you do, you're better protected. So that's what I call the seatbelt principle taking logical, reasonable precautions based on clarity, consistency, and on evidential basis. Next slide. So in, in conclusion, I also think that when all else fails, use common sense, and that can get us through a lot of choppy waters. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ref. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Jan. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Thank you very much for your presentation, providing a sports uh, perspective as we move into the what you call the uncharted water. And uh, we thank you again for your uh, contribution, as I mentioned, to our earlier uh, session. We're moving on now to Ambassador Jimmy Kolker, who is a former chief of the HIV AIDS section of UNICEF New York headquarters and the former Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs, the United States Department of Health and Human Services and a former US ambassador uh, to a number of countries in uh, Africa. We want to thank him also for his uh, contribution to our studies in the role of diplomacy in world affairs, past lessons, and future outlook. Ambassador Goldsberg, please. Thanks very much. And I also have a slide deck. I hope the, that ILI can launch that. Um, I can, yeah, the first one gave my affiliations. I'm a rare bird, which is that I was the um, first diplomat, uh, a foreign service officer, to hold a senior position in the Department of Health and Human Services, our Ministry of Health. I was in charge of international affairs there, and so 
it's with that perspective that I'm going to talk about um, my experience in the Obama administration and but uh, observation since then of why the US government was not adequately prepared for coronavirus. Next slide. I'll cover five topics. Uh, I know Ambassador Ray at the last session talked a little bit about the Ebola legacy, so I'll be brief on that, and then talk about China, talk about the interagency process, and some of the um, preparedness questions in the inter of the uh, State Department, as well as the implications for US leadership. Next slide. We advance the slide here. Thanks. Um, I think we skipped one. There was an Ebola slide ahead of that one. Yes. Um, just to say that the although all of us were late in responding to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, World Health Organization in particular was slow. The once we got going, the process basically worked well. The USAID emerged uh, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance which has DART teams, the CDC surged um, personnel into West Africa. NIH had some countermeasures, which uh, started clinical trials. And the Public Health Service, the US Commission Corps, actually staffed the Ebola Treatment Center outside of Monrovia for health workers, which was a major factor in the response. US military provided that logistical support to get the treatment units in place in Liberia. And although we, did rev up our domestic preparedness and got emergency funding for it, that preparedness was never tested. There were only um, three people who acquired Ebola in the United States that did not acquire those, uh, that did not come here already having been diagnosed with Ebola. And there were lots of after action studies and among the recommendations of the six blue ribbon commissions, there was a need to do better but they also talked about the centrality of WHO and reforming WHO to become the organization we needed it to be. They recommended that the instruments, in addition to WHO that were already in place, were the international health regulations, which are the only WHO binding instrument, as well as the global health security agenda and the G7 commitment to help 77 low and middle income countries achieve, some, achieve the international health regulations which only about a quarter of the world's countries actually had implemented by 2014. And there also was a USAID PREDICT project already underway to look for zoonotic infections and including especially those that originated with bats. Next slide. We also had a strong history of relations between bilateral relations with China and the health area. After the SARS outbreak in 2003, when many of Chinese weaknesses were identified, they, the, the Chinese government itself established the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention based on the US CDC model. US CDC has, uh, assigned staff to China. It's part of our diplomatic, uh, chief, under Chief of Mission Authority, Chief uh, Diplomatic Mission. They were co-located at the Chinese CDC, so there was a very close cooperation, such that when the H7N9 um, outbreak occurred earlier in this decade, a bird flu, a avian influenza outbreak, about uh, the Chinese asked for and under Chinese leadership, about 40 CDC experts came to join the national response in China. And the Chinese and the US also worked together on Ebola in Liberia. And we were the two main partners for the Africa CDC, which was established in 2016. Next slide. However, since 2016, the relations have, have uh, not been as strong. This started in the Obama administration based on recommendations uh, following the attacks in Benghazi. The CDC people were gradually moved from the Chinese CDC to the embassy compound. As Ambassador Ray knows, and we've talked about this in other, on other fora, this was a worldwide phenomenon. And it, did, it wasn't particular to China, but it is a big disadvantage in not being outside embassy walls and in direct communication with your counterparts in the host country. And that, um, as we'll see, had some consequences for the um, coronavirus response. There also was a legacy that the Trump administration seized on that the Commission for National Health and Family Planning in China, which is their Ministry of Health, is very much established and connected with the one-child policy. And it meant that the 
the Trump administration asked the Health and Human Services to reduce our footprint in China and trade disputes, which in, are very closely connected to trade in health supplies and the uh, initial uh, pharmaceutical ingredients for our drug supply and so on, are, were very much part of the trade discussions as well. And so the CDC staff, including locally employed staff, between 2017 and today, were reduced from 47 to 14. And the last embedded CDC position was abolished. The, there's no one any longer at the Chinese CDC. And this was particularly important because it's a program called Field Epidemiology Training Program. And that FETP program had uh, American CDC experts working directly with young epidemiologists in China and working on programs to do exactly the kind of surveillance that was needed during the uh, coronavirus outbreak. And in February this year, when the embassy uh, evacuated non-essential staff, all of the FDA and NIH staff who were posted in China were also evacuated in part of this embassy drawdown. Again, they weren't singled out, but it does look in retrospect as though declaring them non-essential might have been a short-sighted move in terms of figuring out what was going on in China, having those peer-to-peer uh, -peer contacts. And even though these people are working from the US now, just the difference in time zones and not being in the atmosphere in China where uh, you can be aware of uh, changing developments has put them at a disadvantage. And it, the, these deteriorating relations may also be a factor in the fact that the um, US did offer, as we had during H7N9, to supplement the Chinese response with American experts, but these offers were not accepted. Next, next slide. At the same time, our domestic structures were um, uh, perhaps not adequately prepared for the threat that uh, we were facing. Um, the National Security Council Directorate for Global Health Security and Biodefense, which was established in 2016, ironically, this having an NSC office on global health security started in the Clinton administration. It was dismantled by the Bush administration. It was reestablished by the Bush administration, dismantled by the Obama administration when they came into power, and then reinstituted by the Obama administration. So this has been quite a bouncing ball. But this was established and retained by the Trump administration with four staff, with uh, Admiral Tim Ziemer, a very respected uh, person who'd been from the President's Malaria Initiative, as the head. And he reported to Tom Bosley, the Homeland Security Advisor, essentially the number two in the NSC. But when John Bolton became National Security Advisor early in 2018, he immediately abolished the jobs of both Bossert and Ziemer, and people were sent to other directorates within the NSC staff. The rationale was streamlining that they had a, wanted five security priorities and that none of these were in soft power areas like global health. And so who will move to the Weapons of Mass Destruction Counteracting Threat Division working on biosecurity. But the functions that were lost, I think, in this were that there was no one institutionally as a smoke alarm to look around at developments around the world and get the kind of agency mobilization, in the first instance is HHS paying attention to these, but also the attention of our political leadership, and especially the president. And also, uh, many people don't realize that the group of seven uh, summits are prepared entirely by the White House. The staffing is done centers around the Sherpas who are at the White House. And without a White House office responsible for the health security, those issues got, um, did not get priority on the G7 agenda. And as you may have seen, although there was a document released, it was not a formal document of a G7 agreement because we couldn't even agree on the name of the virus uh, to be responded to. Next slide. The people on the National Security Council staff did contribute two very useful documents, a national biodefense strategy and a national health security strategy. Next slide. These, slide, these uh, strategies anticipated that if there were a threat as of the kind that we uh, have now from an outbreak or epidemic, that there would be a task force chaired by the Dep Secretary of Health and Human Services and that the coordinator would be the HHS Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. 
uh, organization called ASPR within HHS. And I, when I saw this, uh, having been at HHS and having been part of the response during Ebola and Zika, I realized that some of, some of the perhaps handicaps that this would have. One is that HHS is an intensely domestic agency, but it, which really does not have a mandate to look at US economic or security policy or its impact. It also is a technical agency. It really does not um, easily get the attention of the president. And there, in fact, were personality clashes between the HHS leadership and the White House and OMB at the time, early this year, when this task force was mobilized. HHS within the government doesn't have the convening authority that the White House has, or even that the State Department has on uh, issues that uh, affect international affairs or security policy. And I know from my experience as a Foreign Service officer at HHS, that there's very little knowledge there in the leadership, as there didn't need to be about how the State Department or DOD or even USAID work. And significantly, for those of us who've been in the diplomatic world, the, state, the Health and Human Services Department can't instruct embassies. We can't send a message to ambassadors saying, pay attention to this or please report on that. Next slide. So that task force did not prove to be what the government needed and was replaced by a task force led by Vice President Pence. The HHS secretary, the CDC director, and the ASPR were not even uh, always members of that task force and were not at the press conferences where they reported results. Um, the health input came from two very um, talented scientists and communicators, Tony Fauci and Debbie Burke. So the point of view of uh, public health doctors was represented. But as we see, the, there was no single spokesperson. There was no coordinated message as Dr. Raff has just um, referred to. And because the international health area was not well represented, there, in addition to the G7 example, there was, I think, not appreciation of what WHO was trying to do in and with China. There was not uh, knowledge that was brought into this of how international supply chain and export and import functions work. For instance, our liaison with the only people in China authorized to export personal protective equipment to the United States, um, only, that was one of the people evacuated. So we had no one who could even communicate standards for US equipment to Chinese, the Chinese authorities that could approve export of that equipment, which has been a bottleneck uh, to this day. And finally, preparedness in places like Africa, where the US has often been the global health lead in um, preparedness and response to outbreaks, um, was not given priority. And a, real gross, gross um, uh, neglect of migrants and humanitarian emergencies where the risks are, are high and there's no one at a global level looking out for the, the people who are in those difficult situations. Next slide. Next slide, please, yeah. Um, in fact, the idea that nobody saw this coming was certainly true in certain circumstances. I have two perhaps uh, parallels here. I think we were looking at a, a pandemic of global consequences of the kind we're experiencing now, very much like an asteroid. That this was something that, yes, it probably was coming. In fact, they say there's a 5% chance that by 2095 we'll have a, a huge uh, impact on, on life on Earth. But from day to day, we didn't in any way devote our lives to, um, cha to changing anything or anticipation or preparation for this event. And yes, we were paying people to track it and perhaps warn us when it, if it were coming, but it had very little resonance in uh, how we organized our lives or our government operated. The more, tell, I think the more appropriate parallel is terrorism. Um, just like outbreaks, there are dozens of terrorist incidents a year. They kill people in the tens of thousands worldwide every year, but, and like, most of the outbreaks we've experienced in the last um, couple decades, 95% of those were not in the United States. In this case, the victims were in the Middle East, Africa, or South Asia. But nonetheless, 42% of Americans said they were worried or very worried about themselves or a family member being victim of a terrorist attack. 
and we are spending on the order of a trillion dollars a year, hundreds of billions of dollars, trying to look at, mitigate the circumstances which produce terrorists in the Middle East, kinetic actions against ISIS and others who, um, other terrorists, uh, activities of our airports costing hundreds of, uh, costing billions of dollars to prevent terrorist um, activity on airplanes. And definitely in terms of the intelligence and military communities, tens of thousands of employees looking at uh, how to prevent, mitigate, prepare for terrorism. We, if we had looked at pandemic diseases the same way, we might have um, seen that there were over 100 outbreaks in 2019, but the appropriations for uh, pandemic preparedness and response were about one one hundredth of what we were spending as US government on terrorism. Next, next slide. We, we did see this coming and there is a play, I contributed to both of these documents, the playbook for early response to high consequence disease threats, as well as ending the cycle of crisis and complacency, US Global Health Security, which the Centers for Strategic and International Studies issued last December. And I was one of the commissioners on that study. Next slide. You also heard from the president himself that the US is the best prepared country in the world for an outbreak. And that's true. This report, which also came out late last year from the na uh, national, um, what, what's called um, Nuclear Threat Initiative and the Johns Hopkins Health Security Organization um, did show that the US was number one. We got 83 and a half out of 100 in, the, in scores, but next slide. But if you look at the actual factors that were taken into account, we fell short in a number of places. Starting on the right-hand screen, as we're seeing now, our health capacity in clinics, hospitals, and community care centers didn't even get a passing grade. We were at 60% of where we should have been in terms of that preparedness. For medical countermeasures and personal deployment, maybe we got a D minus. And for healthcare access, we way down there at F, that only only 25 percent of um, what we would what we need if there were an outbreak of the kind that we have, and then if you look on the left hand side, lesson we needed to learn from the military: exercise, exercise, exercise. We had not exercised our response plans at all. We, the U.S. was at zero for exercising those plans. Next slide. So, as a diplomatic audience, the uh, question is: Where was the State Department? I described the two offices that are responsible for global health at the State Department. Neither has visibility with the geographic bureaus of the department or the seventh floor where the decisions are made and the policymakers um, would need to be alerted in order to mobilize our diplomatic community overseas and domestically to try to um, make this a priority. Next slide. The Consequences of that are that I think we're going to see that we have not engaged diplomatically. We have not understood how the rest of the world is responding and how U.S. leadership could take uh, could help improve that response. That we're going to have competition rather than cooperation in developing vaccines, countermeasures, and insert in searching needed supplies. The issues about um, these. Uh, phase trials and development of vaccines and uh, therapies are that they're, they're thorny issues of intellectual property, of sovereignty and equity. And I think anyone listening to this call, if you can work on one thing over the, over the next few months to think about equity issues, how are we gonna match the needs that are identified throughout the world um, for a coronavirus vaccine with a year from now when that vaccine is manufactured by a firm, maybe in the US, maybe in China, maybe somewhere else. But the demand for that in the host market and the sovereign uh, assertion of uh, trying to get the domestic market treated first is going to be overwhelming. And these access issues, there are not global norms that actually apply very well to how we deal with equity in terms of meeting global health emergencies. And the fact that we've had this suboptimal diplomatic engagement means that our information gathering and our influence has been diminished. 
that allies and adversaries are not looking to the United States to help them solve their problems or necessarily as the world's leading expert in terms of how to deal with these issues. The multilateral system is still is not functioning as well as it could because of a lack of US leadership. The G7 and G20 have not taken leadership and often it's the US that's driving the health issues in those. The World Bank also, which has a, a kind of reinsurance system, which was which instituted after Ebola, has not dispersed that. Ida did not get a global health security window in its last replenishment. And the UN Security Council, because of US-China rivalries and, and again, a, an unfamiliarity with global health as a security issue, has not exerted that the kind of leadership that was needed. And as an American diplomat, it's sad to see that some of that vacuum, at least, is being filled by China and the Chinese bilateral and multilateral relationships are uh, moving in ways that the US historically has been the country to which uh, both countries and organizations have turned when there's been a global health threat. So thanks, I look forward to your questions. I've tried to be a little bit provocative, but um, it's uh, appreciate being part of the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Coker for your uh, overview, and particularly the implications for US and global uh, leadership. We'll come back to you a little bit later on. We're going to call on our colleague, Ambassador Charles Ray, uh, who was uh, formerly an ambassador in Cambodia and Zimbabwe, and also former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for P. O W and missing personnel affairs and so on and uh, we appreciate academically his contribution to our project on the role of diplomacy in world affairs. Ambassador Ray, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alexander. Yeah, as of as of uh, this morning, when I checked the the numbers, COVID nineteen has infected nearly two million people around the world and the casualty count now exceeds that of the decade-long Vietnam War. Uh, in fact, in the U.S., the casualty count is greater than our seemingly unending Mideast conflicts. And as a former military professional, my initial inclination uh, is to ask what lessons we've learned from this tragedy, but as a former diplomat, what I'd like to know is where do we go from here and how do we apply those lessons? I think one of the most important lessons we should have learned is the truth of the old saying that failure to plan is planning to fail. Humanity's continued encroachment into the habitats of other creatures make, in my opinion, such incidents as this inevitable. And we have a fairly extensive history already with SARS, Ebola, and some of the other viral outbreaks so it's now, I think, incumbent upon our leaders around the world to develop and coordinate plans and acquire resources to cope with the next, while at the same time, manage the recovery from the current crisis. It's doubtful that future outbreaks like this can be prevented. And here I'll yield to my more qualified scientific and medical colleagues, but I honestly believe that with proper planning and preparation and enlightened leadership, we can mitigate the impact of future outbreaks. What we should not do is play the blame game, as tempting as it might be in an election year. Who didn't do the right thing, who did what wrong this time or the time before, I think is far less important than how we can get it right the next time. We need to show that we care. We need to show that we can walk and chew gum at the same time by helping people recover from the current crisis while at the same time preparing them to withstand the next. Uh, it won't be an easy thing to do but effective leadership is not about taking the easy way. It's about finding the way that works and inspiring other people to follow. In times like these, unfortunately, there's a tendency for people to withdraw from contact with those we don't know. 
to adopt an us versus them attitude. Uh, while, and while I think maintaining physical distance or social distancing, if you will, is important in controlling the spread of an infection, social distancing should not mean communications distancing. Effective cooperation and coordination at the local, regional, national, and international levels is essential to be able to successfully defeat an enemy that's invisible to the naked eye, that respects no border, respects no ethnicity, no income level, and no political affiliation. Uh, to limit the spread of infection, we have to stand apart but not stand alone. Now's the time to strengthen our international alliances, not sever them. Uh, in the words of Benjamin Franklin, one of the United States' first diplomats at the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 70, 1776, we must all hang together, or most assuredly, we will all hang separately. We don't know now if Franklin actually said those words, but it's a safe bet to say that in the face of the common enemy of the time, the thought was on many minds. In today's world, humanity again faces a common enemy, a viral infection that imperils lives on a global scale. History can teach us lessons. We need to weather the next pandemic, and we can learn not just from things that we got right this time, but from our mistakes as well. It behooves us to take the lessons of history to heart. As Dr. Ref said earlier, in Churchill's 1948 paraphrase of George Santayana's comment on ignorance of history, if we don't learn from history, we are certainly condemned to repeat it. Oh, wow. Something I don't think we want oh, to do. Thank you. We'll come back to you now. I want to move on quickly to our uh, last uh, panelist, Ambassador Zango Abdul, who is a former senior Nigerian diplomat, uh, including serving uh, in the embassy uh, in Washington, D.C. At the time, also, he contributed academically to our work and studies on Boko Haram and so on. Currently, is the country manager of the United States Institute of Peace in Abuja, Nigeria. Welcome, Ambassador. Hello. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, quite a lot had been said in the reflections, especially by my colleague ambassadors, and uh, I will avoid repeating myself by highlighting some of the key issues. Uh, undoubtedly, COVID-19 uh, is perhaps the most devastating uh, challenges facing the, the most devastating challenges facing the global community today. And uh, I cannot agree more with uh, uh, the first ambassador of Croatia uh, who highlighted that one of the biggest lessons to learn uh, has to do with our uh, level of global cooperation. The multilateral cooperation is absolutely very important. And uh, COVID-19 has shown that gap is lacking and I think we need to really do more. Uh, some of the leading countries, the United States, the EU, that need to lead in this campaign uh, really dropped the ball uh, along the line. So one of the biggest uh, challenge is this uh, multilateralism that is required. Uh, now, if you look at the current situation, especially for us in Africa, uh, the COVID-19 really uh, is a major challenge uh, 
in Ebola, we had a wonderful response, particularly in Nigeria. But the magnitude of the COVID-19 pandemic, the spread, uh, the, if you like, uh, quicker spread of the pandemic, uh, virtually left most of the countries uh, uh, with no idea whatsoever, and uh, especially in the face of decrypt and uh, very, uh, if you like, outdated health infrastructure. So this has been a major challenge. Uh, so really, one of the major requirements here required uh, is the response. Uh, the response has been largely mixed, uh, uh, largely due to the complexity of the whole uh, incident. And uh, many of the uh, countries really with very little resources have to resort to what they could do. Uh, in Nigeria, we were able to immediately uh, follow back to our Ebola response mechanism, which we put in place, even though a little delayed, uh, but it worked for us. Uh, there is currently in place a uh, lockdown on major cities, Lagos, Abuja, and uh, Ogun. Uh, three of those uh, constitute 70% of the infection rate in Nigeria. Uh, there are 20 states that have now uh, have incidents of COVID-19 and uh, in those states also, the governors have instituted several restrictions. Some have locked down uh, here and there. But uh, the major challenge now is the lack of coordination between the federal and the state government. Uh, which is also something prevalent in the U.S. There is a very strong debate over who has power to do what in terms of opening up uh, restrictions, opening up the economy. We have similar things here in Nigeria, even though there is a sense of unity in terms of uh, recognizing the need to have this uh, lockdown. Uh, the major issue with the lockdown uh, really is the issue of palliatives. Uh, majority of Nigerians are informal sector. Uh, they work daily to earn a living. Uh, the bulk of them must move out to do engage in one trade or business or the other. The lockdown essentially will cut them from doing that. And that means they will not be able to earn a living. And uh, this is a major challenge. So government has introduced uh, palliatives to ameliorate their sufferance. But in a country where you have over 80 million uh, in extreme poverty, uh, this COVID-19 has presented even a bigger challenge because even with that COVID-19, you need to address that 80 million. And uh, so these palliatives, uh, as good as they are and well thought, they will not go far enough. They have not gone far enough. And, uh, Clearly, when the president addressed the country yesterday evening to extend the uh, lockdown in uh, Abuja, Lagos, and Ogun, he increased the palliatives from 2.4 million to 3.6 million. Uh, and uh, if you are looking at 80 million uh, in extreme poverty, 3.6 million is just a drop in the ocean, but nonetheless, it's something. Uh, so basically, that's where we are. Uh, one of the major issue which uh, was clearly uh, raised by all the ambassadors here is that uh, a big lesson to learn from this COVID-19 is the fact that we are united by our common humanity and that if we address this uh, pandemic uh, looking beyond the disparity between the rich and the poor, the developed and the underdeveloped will go a long way. So. Uh, Co cooperation at the multilateral level, at the regional level, at all levels is absolutely very important. Uh, very important and very key at this time. And uh, I agree entirely with the last speaker. Uh, if we fail to do something, then we will uh, regret it. And uh, so it's very important that we look at this. Then the other thing, uh, another lesson we have learned is uh, in the context of Africa, 
uh, is the fact that uh, I like in the developed world where you don't have to do much to tell people the need to lock down, the need to uh, do social distancing. There is so much to be done because of the level of illiteracy. And uh, this is a major challenge and government has embarked on major campaigns to do that uh, using the media, religious organizations, and uh, civil society, non-governmental organizations that are trying to do that, but it's a major challenge because there are clear signs of total denial. Uh, there are many people who don't believe that this COVID-19 is there. Uh, they think it's a scam to either uh, prevent them from practicing their religion or pursuing their daily life. So that's another major challenge. Uh, in terms of security, uh, we are seeing a situation where those countries that are already facing large-scale conflict and the insurgencies, terrorism, especially in the Sahel, uh, COVID-19 will get added to the larger challenge. It's going to be very difficult for them to uh, face those challenges. So they become very open uh, to this uh, pandemic. And, uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, many of them are our neighbors, Chad, Niger, and uh, they have large scale uh, incidences. Uh, if we look at it from the context of the West Africa sub region, so Chad has over 300, Niger has over 400, and we share common borders. They simply don't have the wherewithal to do that. And uh, while COVID 19 is ravaging these countries, uh, ISIS and other fringe terrorist groups are uh, continue to uh, inflict severe, uh, uh, if you like, severe, uh, uh, plunging them into more crisis. So this is a major challenge. So in essence, uh, the key lesson to learn and the outlook, the key lesson to learn is that we really need to come together, like my colleagues had highlighted. Uh, this is time for unity. This is time for common humanity. And this is time for uh, uh, all nations to put hands on deck and uh, galvanize all resources to fight this pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 presents an opportunity for Africa and indeed the global community to come in one unison, uh, like somebody said, uh, a Marshall Plan you know, to address this. And, uh, the IMF, some of the multilateral institutions are doing small things here and there, but they are not uh, that far enough. There is strong criticism, for example, that uh, the World Bank did not include Nigeria as one of the countries to enjoy debt relief on account of COVID-19. Uh, so these are some of the issues. And uh, uh, like some of my colleagues raised, uh, I believe the outlook is that at the end of this pandemic, and hopefully very soon, I'm very optimistic about that, uh, the world, a new world order will emerge. And uh, it is my hope that it is now a world order that will remove or make a paradigm shift from this uh, uh, difference between the developed and underdeveloped, the West and the, the North and the South, it will now be a world united by common humanity so that we address this pandemic because this pandemic has really united us. It has flattened all the perimeters uh, of uh, measuring development. I want to thank you for the opportunity and I will hang on uh, for your questions and comments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Abdul, for your uh, insights and the message, the key message, that it is time to come together. Together we're going to be better. And your uh, interdisciplinary actually discussion all the way from uh, the political, the economic, diplomatic, uh, and so forth. So thank you again, and we'll be uh, obviously in touch later on. I hope if we do have time, we have to move on to our commentators, the uh, Dr. Peter Rudik, is Peter Rudik there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Oh, wonderful. I, I'm, I'm delighted that you are here. And uh, we uh, certainly would uh, like to hear from you uh, in your role as 
a scholar and assistant law librarian of Congress for Legal Research. Also, we're grateful for your contributions over the years to our studies. Well, as the only current federal employee, I have to start with saying, please don't hold my employer responsible for what I will be saying, because I'm here on my own. And after saying that, I would like to thank you and for organizing this event, for arranging such an interesting discussion, and all speakers for sharing their views on what was done and what can and needs to be done to win this fight against coronavirus. What was especially important in this discussion Speakers show with the variety of approaches to the problem. We heard uh, how to tackle the virus from the point of view of scholars, physicians, diplomats, security professionals. Similarly, based on their background, they shared with us what can be improved in the post-pandemic world. Even though we are learning a lot, most of the consequences of this pandemic are still unknown. It is clear that the impact of this pandemic on our lives will be far beyond just the medical or biological field. It will affect social, political, geopolitical, economic, and many other aspects of life. This is understood by many, and that is why we witness today the, the appearance of multiple studies trying to assess and predict our future developments. Most of them say that our world will be reshaped dramatically. Some foresee a fourth awakening of democratic governance. Others predict that all social political practices of the past except of only recently created will be gone. Our speakers today demonstrated a balanced approach, and that reminded me of a recent article by Richard Haas in the Foreign Affairs, where he says that what is going on is not a turning point, but a way station on the road. Definitely, many things will be reshaped. Many trends, which were evident in the last years, but didn't shape into a formal transformation, will be reinforced. We at the Law Library are working usually on studies on foreign comparative and international law in response to inquiries from our users. Just when all these things with COVID started, we were asked to look at what foreign legislative and judicial bodies are doing in order to adjust their work to current necessities. What arrangements were made by national legislatures to ensure their work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Similar study was conducted about the courts. We should remember that these are institutions where traditions are thoroughly preserved and continuity of procedures is an important factor. And we found that many countries have special rules for legislatures aimed at facilitating their work in times of emergency, such as meeting outside of the capital like Norway, extending legislative time limits in Kenya, Mexico, Turkey, for example, simplifying or expediting legislative procedures in Germany, Israel, Malta, Switzerland. Apart from Germany, laws of the surveyed countries didn't designate a subgroup of legislators with developed power to respond to emergencies. But whereas quorum requirements still apply in many jurisdictions. Beyond quorum requirements, several legislative bodies employ or envision employing pairing or proxy arrangements to minimize the number of physical votes required in times of emergency while maintaining equal representation. While travel of members and staff may be restricted, operational arrangements include utilizing video conferencing and other electronic means to maintain legislative activities, formulating special voting procedures to reduce attendance, providing new accountability measures where legislative activities are interrupted. In order to continue function, function remote deliberation system was established in the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil. In New Zealand, for example, procedures have been adopted allowing a limit of numbers on proxy votes that may be cast, allowing oral questions to be lodged electronically, and allowing decision-making in other electronic forms. Many countries are exploring options to maintain legislative operations with fewer members present. For example, in the UK House of Commons, only front bench MPs and a limited number of others are permitted to enter into the Commons. Many interesting initiatives are under consideration in our Congress also. Similar developments occur in the field of judiciary. Many countries are switching toward using video conference option and trials. Some, like Australia and New Zealand, conclude agreements on accepting a cross-border testimony. Norway stopped all oral arguments and converted all hearings into remote proceedings. In Russia, 
in a rush to finish trials before the country's lockdown. A judge in a remote rural district conducted a trial using WhatsApp connection and having a party to dispute, connect, to dispute connected to him over the phone via the messenger app. Israel just piloted to conduct virtual civil trials due to COVID-19 pandemic. You can also find what other countries are doing in this regard and how they respond to COVID-19 challenges in our Global Legal Monitor on the Law Library of Congress website. Recuperation from a disease often leads to changes. Probably following our speakers today, we can say the same about major political and government institutions. We hope that after we defeat the virus, our government structures will be able to adapt to new challenges and will adjust to all accumulated changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rudy, uh, for your presentation, particularly uh, dealing from the perspective of foreign law on the national, regional, and global perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to ask uh, Professor Don Wallace, would you like to make some final comments or any other uh, comments uh, or uh, a few minutes uh, over time, but uh, it was uh, <clears throat> very useful, very rich discussion. Um, at least the good news is that uh, those of us academically in the scientific diplomatic community uh, were planning to follow up with um, a series of discussions in uh, the coming months. And uh, the next one, the next topic, I think, would be discussed related to the impact on, on business, the implications, and what can be done. And we'll try to be in touch with you. Uh, Professor Wallace, uh, last word. I just want to thank you, Yona, once again. Thank Peter and the others. I'm sorry Guy Roberts wasn't here. Thank everyone on the panel. And uh, let's wish ourselves well. Take care, be socially distant, but humanly close. And Yona, thank you again so much. So, abianto, bye bye. Hi, thank you. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.